So to take a step back and look at the general Canadian natural gas industry, Canada is the fifth largest producer and sixth largest exporter of natural gas in the world, a resource used across residential, commercial, and industrial sectors, one of those sectors being transportation. Um, so natural gas may be used directly in the transportation sector via compressed or liquefied natural gas. But another important consideration is as the transportation sector undergoes this massive transition towards electrification, we need to be mindful as to where this electricity is coming from, specifically from natural gas powered uh, plants. So while my research does not look at these end uses and the uh, transportation sector's use of natural gas, there's important connections when we're looking at the upstream natural gas industry. So if we take a look at Canada's Energy Future, which is an annual report that I put out by the Canada Energy Regulator that projects Canada's energy mix through to 2050, we see that under both evolving policy scenarios as well as current policy scenarios, that natural gas will continue to play an important role in Canada's energy mix. And when looking at the upstream natural gas industry, just as a brief primer, these are some of the main um, activities or phases involved in that. Starting with well pad preparation, where the ground is cleared and leveled with heavy duty vehicles. Drilling, which is uh, when wells are drilled several kilometers into the ground using diesel powered drilling rigs. They may be hydraulically fractured. They undergo flaring where excess gas is burned up into the atmosphere. And then wells move into this producing and processing phase before storage and transport. And each of these phases contribute a number of different equipment and sources of air pollution uh, from nitrogen oxides to particulate matter and hydrocarbons. So back to the Canadian natural gas industry, in terms of where natural gas is located in Canada, the Monty Shale gas play spans uh, Alberta and British Columbia and is the second largest store of natural gas in North America. And if we look again at Canada's energy future, we see that natural gas will be increasingly made up of the Monty Shale gas play from the British Columbia side. So drilling in this area began in 2005 with just 88 producing wells and grew to 2020 to over 4,000 wells. And the rapid increase of the industry in this area is attributed uh, to technological advancements and hydraulic fracturing, more commonly known as fracking where a mixture of chemical, water, and sand is pumped down into the drilled wells to fracture the rock formation and free the trapped natural gas in areas where it was previously not economically feasible to do so. Last year, over 98% of wells drilled in British Columbia in the Monty Shale gas play were hydraulically fractured. So despite the rapidly growing industry in this region, very few researchers have looked at the impacts on the local communities and related health outcomes. But a researcher who is looking at this is Dr. Elise Karen Boudoin, who's a professor in the Department of Health and Society at U of T Scarborough. And over the past few years, she's worked with cohorts of pregnant women looking at their association between negative birth outcomes and their exposure to these fracking wells. And what she's found is that higher levels of benzene has been found in the urine of these pregnant women compared to the general Canadian population. She's also found associations between increased levels of VOCs in the tap water and indoor air samples of their homes with higher density and closer proximity to fracking wells and called for further monitoring of VOCs. Due to the relatively sparse air quality monitoring network in this region, assessing these women's exposure to particular air pollutants of concern has been difficult, which is where my project came in, a collaboration between the Department of Engineering and the Department of Health and Society to generate more comprehensive data to better understand the impacts of fracking operations on air quality in northeastern BC, and to pave the way for a larger investigation of the impacts of fracking on rural areas of Canada and its environmental justice implications. So I'm going to briefly go over the first two projects of my thesis, the first being um, the building of the land use regression modeling, and then the second being a direct application to study environmental justice in the region. So the first one, land use regression, or LUR, was to develop these models for a region in northeastern BC with intensive hydraulic fracturing activities and apply these model resorts to the location of the exposures in Peace River Valley or Experva cohort as estimates of ambient outdoor air pollutant concentrations. So if we look at our study area, it's in northeastern BC in the Peace River Regional District, which is home to about 60,000 people and has an economy centered around oil and gas extraction. And if we blow out the map to the study area, um, I know it's a little hard to see, but we have the expert participants. So these are 85 pregnant women who were pregnant between 2018 and 2020. 
as well as uh, air quality monitors that are operating in the area in red. But the most prominent thing you're seeing is all of these purple dots on the map, and those were wells that were active from 2018 to 2020. So you're seeing a lot of wells, and you're seeing them in really close proximity to where people are living. So briefly, what land use regression modeling is, is it's um, a technique commonly used in air pollution studies that develops an empirical relationship between measured concentrations of air pollution with predictor variables of that air pollution. So typically, LUR models are developed for really urban areas, uh, Dr. Hatsopoulou's team has developed them for Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and they use predictors like population density, vehicle counts, distance to highways, distance to airports. But what's novel about our model is because this is a more rural area where the predominant source of air pollution is believed to be the oil and gas industry, we used oil and gas production data as our predictor variables. So we pulled air quality measurements from the existing air quality monitoring network, we pushed our data collection back to 2013 to get as much air quality data as possible, and we're able to pull data from, eight, from uh, 25 different air quality monitors with a total of 18 different air pollutants being measured, and these monitors were operated by the province as well as by industry through the British Columbia Energy Regulator. We then developed our predictor variables um, from oil and gas production data publicly available from the BC Energy Regulator. So this involved around well activity, so things like counts of pad preparations happening, drilling events, length of the drilled wells, cracking events, counts of wells uh, producing oil and gas and the volume of those products. We also had geographic data on the facility locations, pipeline segments, pipeline equipment, and commissioned roadways. And then we also pulled annual emissions data from the National Pollutant Release Inventory, which is a publicly available database managed by Environment and Climate Change Canada that collects facility reported um, emissions of criteria air contaminants on an annual basis. We also developed predictor variables around the geographic and meteorological um, data collected by the air quality monitors as well. So we prepared all of this data in a standard uh, process for land use regression models in ArcGIS, and then we built the models using multiple linear regression where predictors were added based on the R squared, and the models were validated using a cross validation. We then use these developed equations uh, to predict concentrations at the homes of the pregnant women. So we developed a total of 54 models, 18 air pollutants at three temporal scales, predicted monthly, biannual, and annual mean concentrations. And these monthly mean concentrations were passed to the team of Dr. Elise Karen Boudoin, who turned them into trimester-specific exposures to air pollution. We then also use the models predicting annual mean concentrations to generate surfaces to look at the spatial variability of air pollution in the region, um, which you can see on the map, the 18 different air pollutants, looking at the annual average concentration from 2018 to 2020. So I picked a couple of those maps to go through in more detail with different sources um, and the stories that they tell before going into some key takeaways. The first being METEX, which is a summation of benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, whose primary source is mainly fuel burning, but these compounds are also additives to fracking fluids. And you see on the map that the red, the higher concentrations of benzene, is located in that northeastern corner. And when we filter the active wells to wells that were undergoing fracking, we see that those wells are also located in the northeastern corner, uh, which was an interesting connection because VTEX is an additive in the fluid being used. Next, if we look at nitrogen dioxide, primary sources is combustion of fossil fuels. Transportation has a lot of impacts on NO2 concentrations. Um, and we see in our study area that there's hot spots around well activities, as well as around um, just residential areas, which was actually in line with the passive sampling campaign that was done in 2013 that identified similar hot spots of NO2 concentrations and said that it was probably a mix of industrial sources closer to oil and gas facilities, as well as residential from home heating and vehicle use. And next, if we look at the one for ozone, or ground level smog, um, so ozone is a secondary pollutant formed between the reaction of VOCs, nitrogen dioxide, and sunlight, and we see that ozone actually has an opposing spatial pattern to the NO2 map that I had showed just before. Um, so areas that have lower concentrations of NO2, we're seeing areas of high ozone concentrations because of that chemical reaction between ozone and nitrogen dioxide. So because this is a rural study area, it's deemed as a NOx limited environment, so it's very sensitive to increases in NOx emissions. So NOx will lead to the rapid formation and rapid increase of ozone concentrations, which is what we're seeing here. 
You can see the concentrations in the study area range from about 20 to 34 ppb, whereas the annual mean concentration from a station in downtown Vancouver was just 17 ppb. Now, ozone is typically viewed as more of an acute impact uh, pollutant, mainly aggravating asthma. So our team actually recently got funding to build an asthma cohort in this study area and refine these models to predict daily concentrations of ozone so that we can look at more acute health outcomes. And then finally, I pulled the map predicting methane concentrations. There's been a lot of publications in the literature saying that federal inventories estimating uh, methane emissions are underestimating uh, these counts, and that in the field you're seeing much higher concentrations due to leaks and abnormal operations. And what's interesting for methane is we see the higher concentrations around well activities. But we also see the map have some higher concentrations around the really big pipelines that run through the study area. So maybe the equations are picking up on some sort of relationship between the tanks, compressors, valves, and pipeline segments that go into that. In terms of some key takeaways from this work, so we're able to harness the available air quality data to build models capable of predicting at unmeasured locations. The predicted air pollution concentrations at cohort locations were mostly comparable to that being measured by the air quality monitors. With the exception of some concentrations of VTEX compounds and hydrocarbons were being predicted to be much higher at the pregnant women's homes compared to what was being monitored by the air quality monitoring network. The average distance between cohort locations and an air quality monitor monitoring VTEX compounds from 2018 to 2020 was actually 40 kilometers. So these air quality monitors are located very far from where people are living. Given these are pollutants with strong associations with fracking activities and several health impacts, our work is calling for additional monitoring of VOCs in line with Dr. Elise Caribou Joint's previous work. In terms of some study limitations, we did have a low number of air quality monitors and resulting low number of data points than you would like in a land use regression study. However, given the lack of data available to build really robust models to look at the serious health effects and exposure of these pollutants, additional monitoring of both indoor and outdoor concentrations beyond criteria air contaminants is required. The LUR models predict outdoor ambient concentrations of air pollutants at the homes of the cohort participants, but it does not consider mobility related exposure nor can the LUR models uh, be used to predict in areas where they were not developed. They're tied to the geographic area that they were built. We did not consider the impacts from other industries in the region, so Northeastern BC does have some forestry and coal mining. However, we did a comprehensive review of those NPRI facility emissions and found that natural gas extraction is by far the dominating industry in the study domain. Uh, so given the unique characteristics of our study area, really rural-based communities, as well as a high proportion of indigenous population, we then took the LUR predictions to conduct an environmental justice analysis. And this is still ongoing, so I only have very preliminary results to share at this time. Uh, but we were hoping to explore if certain groups are disproportionately exposed to and assess maternal disparities in residential exposure to natural gas operations in northeastern BC. So our study area remains the same as the LUR study. We're conducting this analysis at both a population and an individual level. So at a population level, we're using dissemination areas, or DAs, which is the smallest geographic area in Canada at which census data is available, with a total population in our study area of just under 57,000. We'll be also conducting it at an individual level using survey data collected from the Expertra cohort. So in terms of the dissemination level, we're looking at proportion of Indigenous population. About 5% of the Canadian population identifies as Indigenous, but in our study area, that number decreases to 15%. We'll be also looking at community vulnerability based on an index of rural deprivation, which I'll share on the next slide. At an individual level, we have lots of survey data from the Experva cohort, including household income, maternal level of education, housing ownership, and Indigenous identity. So in terms of a rural index of vulnerability, over 96% of the DAs in our study area based on their population density are considered to be rural. So we developed, we used previous literature for oil and gas environmental justice literature to develop a community vulnerability index based on census variables, including proportion of population with no high school diploma, not in the labor force, designated as low income and unemployed. We then transformed these variables and summed them into an index and split them into quintiles, where the first quintile represents areas that are least deprived, or shown in yellow on the map, and uh, five represents the DAs that are most deprived, shown in red. 
When conducting the exposure assessment based on previous oil and gas environmental justice literature, it's important to consider where people are living in these DAs. The DAs in this area tend to be quite large, with people only living in a very small portion of them. So we um, employed a technique called day symmetric mapping, where we overlay a land cover map um, that shows urban infrastructure, so anything like roads, facilities, homes, and we're only looking at exposures that intersect these urban or built up areas to ensure we're only looking at exposures to where people are actually living and moving around. So our exposures consist of the air pollution concentrations. So we took our LUR maps that were generated at a five kilometer resolution, intersected those with the land cover map, and then ended up with an average concentration of air pollution for each DA that takes into account only air pollution over those urban areas. We did a similar process for facility emissions, so again using those NPRI emissions of criteria air contaminants filtered to only emissions from the oil and gas extraction industry. We created buffers around these emissions, intersected those with the land cover map, and then ended up with a total facility reported level of emissions per DA, where the total is generated by intersecting those five kilometer buffers um, around the urban areas. And we did a similar process with active wells, so these were only active unconventional wells, five kilometer buffer, intersection with land cover, and then sum up to get a total number of wells in each DA. We will be conducting a sensitivity analysis with buffers of three kilometers and 10 kilometers, which is in line with previous literature in this work. Uh, so I have a couple preliminary results to show. So this is showing the indigenous um, exposures. So each one of these box plots represents one of the 18 air pollutants that we predicted using the land use regression models. And in blue, you have the exposures of DAs with less than 50% indigenous population. And in red, you have the DAs with greater than 50% indigenous populations. So what you're seeing across the board is that areas with larger proportions of indigenous population have increased exposure to ambient air pollution levels. We then uh, fit just linear models to test the Pearson correlation between increasing proportions of indigenous population with increasing exposure to hazards. And what we found was there's a positive correlation between increases in proportions of indigenous population with increased ambient air pollution levels. We didn't see this trend, however, with the NPRI emissions or with the active wells. Uh, there were no statistically significant uh, results for those other exposures, but we do see a very high correlation with the air pollution concentrations. Uh, similarly, we looked at the correlations between the rural index of vulnerability, so going from least to most vulnerable with increasing exposure to these hazards. And again, we found areas with a higher level of vulnerability showed a positive correlation with increased ambient air pollution levels, but not so much with the active wells and with the NPRI emissions. And a similar plot in blue, you have uh, the DAs that were labeled as the first quintiles, so the least vulnerable. And in red, you have uh, the DAs that were in the fifth quintile labeled as most vulnerable. And areas with higher level of vulnerability show increased exposure to ambient air pollution concentrations. So some preliminary key takeaways. While static measures of exposures, like counts of active wells and emissions, do not show evidence of environmental disparities, we find significant disproportionate exposures to air pollution concentrations for indigenous and vulnerable populations. And this brings in the importance of including considerations for the fate and transport of airborne species. This will be the first uh, environmental justice work published that looks at air ambient air pollution concentrations in an area of intensive fracking operations. Uh, we also noticed a lack of monitoring of air quality near indigenous reserves. So there's some DAs that have 90 to 100% of the population identifying as indigenous. And we look at where those air quality monitors that went into our study were located they're quite far from these areas. And then finally, uh, we're highlighting the importance of tailoring indices attempting to capture rural disparities to the selected study domain. So we started our analysis using the pre-generated Canadian index of multiple deprivation, but we're finding it was highlighting the more urban areas in our study area as being more deprived because they had more things like uh, increased rentals, increased houses needing repair, people moving around more. So we went back to the literature and found that when working in a rural domain, you need to create your own index based on variables that reflect rural deprivation. In terms of some next steps, so we've shared our concentrations with the team of Dr. Elise Karen Boudoin. Her previous studies were using a technique called inverse distance weighting that just looks at the proximity and density of unconventional wells 
uh, from a women's home location. So she'll be looking at associations between our predicted concentrations of air pollution and this IDW metric. She'll also be looking at associations between our predictions of ambient air pollution with indoor air pollution samples taken in their homes. Uh, more broadly, in terms of next steps, we hope to extend this work um, to all of Western Canada. So we're working with the Alberta Energy Regulator to generate similar predictor variables, um, get similar production variables that we have in British Columbia. The asthma study that I mentioned, this cohort will run from 2004 to present day, so it's a really long time period. If you remember, drilling in this area really scaled up in 2005. Um, so we're going to have data throughout the entire growth of this industry to explore distributive environmental justice implication and see how demographics of the population has changed as this industry grew. And then finally, beyond the ambient air pollution that I spoke of today, there's so many other impacts that come with the upstream industry uh, from noise, odor, vibration. Um, there's been studies that have shown impacts to mental health as well as impacts to climate change through emissions of methane. So we'll take some work to bridge all of these impacts to make sure that we're keeping our rural and remote communities safe. Um, so thank you. You can scan the QR code to see some of the published work so far for the Experva studies, um, and I'm happy to take any questions.